almost everyone. I don't know anyone. If you go out and around town, look at people's faces, look in their eyes, and except for an occasional forced laugh or forced or contrived pleasantry by someone in a business like a restaurant or a store waiting on you, you're not going to see too many happy people. I don't. I wish I did. I know when I was younger I did. Anyway, one of the happiest people I know who has truly created genuine joy and laughter for countless tens if not hundreds of millions of people over his wonderful career is a, a good friend of mine, of yours, and he's on this program once a month, and his name is John Barber, and he's standing, well, I hope he's sitting by somewhere down there in Las Vegas right now. Are you standing or sitting, John? Well, I'm sitting, Jeff, and thanks for depressing our audience. People. Nothing like the truth, is there? <laughs> what I'm doing is I'm sitting here in Las Vegas watching Lake Mead sink, watching the Dow Jones sink, and watching Obama's popularity sink. But now that I'm talking to you, my hopes are on the ride. Gee. All right. Uh, first of all, Lake Mead, that has got to be depressingly low. Have you been out to look at it lately? Well, you don't have to because there are pictures of it all over the Internet. Uh huh. And when I came here exactly 20 years ago, they had these overflow valves that they had to shut off occasionally because the lake was so high. At the dam. At the dam. And yeah. now they're 25 and 30 feet below the overflow valves. And wow. if you look at the yeah. cliffs, I guess it's, I don't know what, I, I guess they call it an alkaline, which is on the cliffs, but you mm -hmm. can actually stand a half a mile away and look at the cliffs that surround the lake and see that it's gone down nearly 40 or 50 feet. So in order to get wow. the water now, mm -hmm. they're spending over a billion dollars to tunnel underneath the lake and come up at the bottom like a bathtub so that they can drain the lake from the bottom. And I must tell you, Jeff, that's I am a, appalled incredible. and stunned that the citizenry that live in this area aren't up in arms and picketing city council every day to stop absolutely all construction in the city of Las Vegas. The reason for that is they're going to drain that water. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, if they could stop it to save the water supply, mm -hmm. property values in this town would skyrocket. Yeah, that's the, uh, that's the given in any axiom like that. You start cutting off water and power, and the property values zoom. Very smart. I mean, you could almost run on that as a political platform. I'm sure anybody who took that stance, if they yeah. didn't have a severe criminal record for yeah, child yeah. molestation, <laughs> could get elected in this city. I live in a really nice area called Mountain's Edge, and they're building literally hundreds of homes around us when there are thousands still owned by the banks. And okay. I don't know who's buying them. Now, when you drive around the streets, do you see for sale signs by bank? In other words, this home for sale by lender? I'm beginning to see a few of those occasionally. Most well, of the time, the banks don't want to mess with... I in my area, but I do see, yeah. see a few uh, for rent signs. Um, okay. Now, another the question. The homes here are smaller than the home that my wife and I lived in before. It's like half the size. It's like 3,200 square feet, and mm -hmm. I guess it's the last refuge for the middle class or the lower middle class. The one encouraging sign I see around the few blocks where I live, though, Jeff, surprisingly, is nearly every car in the driveway is a new car. What the heck does that mean? You know, I don't know. I don't uh -huh. understand it because the city is in serious, serious what? trouble. Zero, nothing down and zero percent for ten years? I guess so. I guess I guess that's what it is. Uh, the other question I had: They're building like crazy there. When I when I was there, I was I worked there for two almost two and a half years. Who's moving into these houses, John? Are, are people fleeing to Las Vegas from other parts of the country? Is there a migration into the town? Uh, I think there is. Uh, 
I think there are a lot of refugees from Southern California. Yeah, I can't blame them for that. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I bump into them once in a while at the mailbox. Here, we don't have a mailbox at your front door the way we used to have. We have mailboxes on the street. They're at the curb. Big, yeah. giant mechanical boxes that once oh, in a while. Oh, are, are they aggregate, like 20 boxes in a cube? Yeah, 20 boxes in a cube. Uh-huh. And once in a while, some enterprising thief will pull it out of the ground and haul it away. And I don't know why, because nobody puts cash in the envelopes when they pay their bills anymore. Well, they're probably uh, selling off the metal. <laughs> Maybe they're aluminum. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> That's funny. Maybe they Maybe they are selling off the scrap metal. That's true. Did you, uh, I sent, I think I sent you a video about a week ago, Hollywood in in the 30s. Did you see, did I send that to you, the color, color yeah, film? Yeah, you always send me that stuff, and I love it. Yeah, kinda, well, there was, there was one thing. It's kind of sad, but I love looking at it. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a time that is gone but it will live forever. And and you got a, a little taste of it. You know, we weren't there in the 30s and 40s and 50s, but you remember people who were, and that much of it you got to certainly experience. And I, my grandfather was a chef at, at Ciro's Restaurant. For oh, almost, my goodness gracious. Oh, How yeah. interesting is that? That was turned into the comedy store. Did you know well, that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was the chef there, and... It was, I guess, in the mid '40s to almost the mid '50s, and his his fr- back then the executive chef friends in a restaurant, a very high end restaurant like Ciro's, they were kind of celebrities, and occasionally they would come out of the kitchen and wa- walk around the dining room and speak to the patrons and how is your how is your dinner how are you and I, the chef would do is a big deal he'd wear his white hat and everything, and he got to know a lot of people. And some of his very best friends, at least in terms of seeing them there and, and elsewhere and on social occasions, were Clark Gable and Errol Flynn and, and uh, Mario Lanza, among many. And those are the ones he mentioned to me that he knew very well. Oh, when and, I first went to uh, Hollywood as a runaway uh, in the 50s, around 50 Oh, well, 60. then Ciro's was still there. Yeah, and not only that, those great red electric cars were on the... The road you, could you take remember it the, the Pacific you could Electric take it down to the beach. They were fabulous, but I used to, oh, I used to go to. Believe it or not, I had no money, and I don't know why they let me in because I only had the one suit. But I guess I, I would draw a mustache and go in. But I went into Ciro's all the time, and then across the street, a place called Macombo, and I sat uh, yep. right next to uh, Edmund O'Brien. Uh, 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 a, a couple of times he played. Uh, Eddie Johnny O'Brien, Dollar yeah. on the radio, and he had uh-huh. this great, great radio voice. But I saw all of them. I saw Vic Damone as a, a young man singing there. And in Ciro's, uh, I saw Andy Williams and his brothers. They were supporting a, a girl singer. Her first name was Kay. I don't remember her last name. but they K-Star? The, uh, no, it wasn't K-Star. Oh, she was a Broadway performer. Mm-hmm. And the bouncer... I hate to mention this name, but since we're talking history, the bouncer was a fellow named George Slaughter who ended up oh owning my. Uh, both real people yeah. and laughing and destroying both real people yeah. and laughing. But that's where he started as a, a bouncer, and he was a bodyguard for Mae West. Oh, too funny. That video I sent you of uh, color, color film of Hollywood in 1939, I believe, maybe 1940. Huh? Showed a little thirty nine, one of Hollywood's best years for that, film. That's right, and it showed. I'm gonna get back to what you were saying in just a minute. It showed a couple of aerial clips in that film, and one of them, the announcer says, as you look down on an obvious little golf course, and he said, one of the many miniature golf courses that Hollywood's elite love to play on and have fun, something like that. And it's true, there used to be a lot of miniature, little miniature golf courses around Hollywood. They were kind of a chosen nighttime fun thing for the folks who lived there to do. But they're all gone. For those who don't know, Los Angeles, greater Los Angeles, used to have the most magnificent all-electric mass transit system in the world, considering the amount of square miles it covered and served. It was called the Pacific Electric. 
And if you do a search for Pacific Electric red cars, you will come up with a bonanza of material. Now, in the 40s, the Pacific Electric began to suffer. It suffered from the attack of General Motors Coach Company, the bus company, Firestone Tire and Rubber, the people who made the tires for buses and cars, and Standard Oil of Ohio. Those three companies formed a dummy corporation which moved into the Pacific Electric stocks and began buying up control of the Pacific Electric. So by 1950 and 55, it was pretty well done. The Pacific Electric died, the tracks were ripped up or paved over, and freeways were put in everywhere. And that's why L.A. lost this magnificent mass transit system. You rode those cars. You know what I'm talking about. Oh, I rode them for nickel, and I rode them all over the place. But Firestone and General Motors would have never been able to accomplish what they accomplished without the the conspiratorial city councilors who all became uh, millionaires sold them sold them by allowing yeah. that to happen. And it's much like... It's might much like the corruption over the water rights in Los Angeles. Uh, this story was told by Robert Towns in Polanski's movie Chinatown with Jack Nicholson about Mulholland. Great film. It was absolutely terrific film. Well, they could make the same kind of movie about the those red cars if somebody would get on it. It would be a phenomenal film. Oh, the red cars? Well, I, when I was very, very little, there was still one or two running, and when they would come to the end of a run, the conductor or the engineer or whatever, the motorman, I think they called him, he would walk from the front of the car to the back of the car and flip those seats. He would flip the seat backs in the opposite direction. Boom, 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 boom all the way through the car. So the next time the people got on, they would be facing forward and the car the red cars could go either direction of course they were magnificent and oh they were wonderful and you have a better memory about them than i do well and i've watched a lot of videos I, yeah. i've watched a lot of videos about them oh. and they have a couple on display and i i've i've driven over in west la it used to be that you could drive through this massive intersection i forget what it was now but you could still see some of the, the rails and it, it's sad because they're like, kind of like tombstone monuments. Now, some of the some of the streets in the valley, was it Victory? One of them is enormously wide, and right down the middle of the street are these huge twenty foot wide uh, green. Well, they're decorated with plants and stuff. Uh, planters, the whole street, and those were where the Pacific Electric tracks used to be. That's why that street is so wide, and many of the streets in L.A are wide because of the P.E. And that train used to, well, train, there were cars. It could do 60 miles an hour, carry up to 80 people, and it would go from Redland, San Bernardino, all the way to San Fernando, down in through L.A., Hollywood, downtown L.A., Long Beach, and even had a leg that ran all the way down to Newport Beach and Balboa. Now, that's coverage. That's for sure. <laughs> All right, enough of that. Now, uh, but anyway, L.A. lost it, and, and then they ended up putting in that, that uh, they have some kind of a subway there, and it was like a billion dollars a mile or something, when they actually still, the city still owned at that time, I don't know what it is now, probably similar, but the city still owned something like 80 to 85% of the rights of way of the old Pacific Electric. In other words, they could have reestablished trolley cars all over the place. Well, the other thing that was really a mystery to me is when uh, the city of Los Angeles, about 30 years ago, decided to build a very extent extensive subway system, that they were going to dig holes in the ground that yeah. would take forever and cost a fortune. When they, all they had to do, since they owned all the freeways, is to have above the ground rails like they do in Chicago. Oh yeah. Because they owned the yeah. property, so they yep. didn't have to dig into the ground. Um, all, all they had to do was put up some pipes and some rails above ground and you would have had a fantastic fantastic system.